Well, hello and greetings from Los Angeles. I'm Gary Steger. I'd like to thank all of you for joining me here. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share some ideas with you. I wish we could all be together in Barcelona, but alas, that's not possible at this time. And I hope you'll excuse my pandemic inspired hairstyle. I also hope that you'll indulge my slightly naughty challenge of one of the conference themes. And that is the case against innovation. I hope I'm able to make the case against innovation during this presentation, as well as offer some objections, remind us of what I believe are the purposes of education and share some strategies for going forward to create productive context for learning. So I'd like to begin by discussing some of my objections to the notion of educational innovation. The first is that innovation tends to be oppositional for its own sake. When my colleagues and I in 1990 began putting laptops in the hands of every learner and using them to program across the curriculum. Um, this was in the spirit of what Seymour Papert had provided and it stood on the shoulders of progressive education giants who came before us. And yet there were any number of schools who despite knowing in their heart of hearts that what we were doing was on the right side of history, they decided that they would stake a claim to innovation by doing the exact opposite by saying that we won't give a computer to every kid. We won't empower them with the, um, the protein machine for serious intellectual and creative work that was rapidly becoming prevalent throughout society. We need to be able to confront the question of who's behind this educational innovation and what's their motive? What is their motivation? We should be able to answer the question, can you point to an actual educational innovation that matters or that's had any significant impact. The big education innovations in the past decade or so have had no record of success, none whatsoever. And like learning, genuine innovation is natural. It's not forced, it's not contrived, and it certainly doesn't stem from a desire for innovation. And I think frankly, innovation and disruption are the wrong objectives with perverse incentives, especially pertaining to education. And I'd like to explore some of the reasons why. I think, first of all, the focus on innovation is a business paradigm rooted in sales, profit, and, and cashing out. The emphasis is on new rather than on good or enduring. Novelty is always prized over quality. And innovation by its very nature is egocentric and zero sum. In order for some people to be innovative, there has to be losers. We have to, we, and education shouldn't be about winners and losers because you're only seven once. Our selfless objective needs to be the development of children. The Silicon Valley adages of fail early and fail often, which Sylvia Martinez likes to point out, should be continued with, with other people's money or run fast and break things are not only inhumane, but they miss the critical mission of schooling, which is to sustain a cultural continuum. To, to build upon what society has created for centuries and generations, um, to be part of something larger than ourselves. We should recognize that competition in education is counterproductive. It has a huge prophylactic impact on, on engagement and participation by lots of different kinds of students. We should recognize that the quest for innovation reeks of privilege. Parents of the children who are most in need of rich educational experiences often don't trust their, sc their school to experiment upon children. And innovation often is portrayed as an experimentation process. We should re also remember that not everyone can be a shopkeeper. Some people need to be workers and those workers deserve a rich life in a thriving democracy filled with beauty and joy and purpose and meaning. When we talk about innovation education, sadly, the emphasis is almost always on the system, not learning. Education is invariably viewed as a treatment model. There's a focus on scale, stockholder value, return on investment, speed, and efficiency, which are misplaced and inappropriate when we're talking about the development of young people. Education innovation is temporary. All educators, anyone who's ever been in a classroom knows this. My colleague and mentor and friend Bernard Newsom in Australia points out that innovations in education, good, bad, or indifferent, have a five-year lifespan. What does he mean by that? 
He means that, you know, teachers are good soldiers. The first year or two, someone gets a bright idea. Everyone really tries to give it a go. By about the third year, it's the teachers have it in their back pocket. They got it, they've got it, the, whatever the innovation was kind of down and they're, they're going with the flow. And then by the fourth or fifth year, a principal changes, a government um, comes into power, a new curriculum is adopted, a stiff wind blows through the classroom. And unless the educators have a deep emotional, intellectual um, appropriation, ownership, of that innovation, it goes right out the window. Now, it should go without saying that you don't get to call yourself an innovator. History alone bestows that designation. And it's sad that we trade innovation for recognizing what's good in education. Innovation tends to be values free, like run fast and break things regardless of the costs, regardless of the, the consequences. And frankly, if we really wanted to improve education, we would find a cure for amnesia because every problem in education has been solved somewhere before. If you look behind me, th there's all sorts of solutions to educational problems, um, new and, and in the future, unforeseen in the books that have already been written. And when I hear educational administrators or policymakers throw up their hands and say, oh, if only we knew what to do, I want to say to them, just swing by my house. I've got a thousand books that I can lend you that can give you ideas and examples and models of what's possible to create rich, productive contexts for learning that engage all sorts of students. We should recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Angelo Petri was an immigrant to New York from Italy and the turn of the 20th century. In 1917, he published a book called The Schoolmaster of the Great City. In it, he identifies and solves every single problem in education today. And yet he did so over a century ago. And one of the things that Patrice says is, I do not remember school ever staying with a beautiful idea long enough to have it become part of children's lives. The quest for innovation is the enemy of schools staying with an idea long enough for it to have a meaningful impact. And we should recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants, as I mentioned a moment ago, that, that there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge that comes from within our own profession. We don't have to look to dilettantes and amateurs and investors and folks who are insecure in their, their positions of leadership and education for, for wisdom and advice and direction. There are, these are just the teachers of mind who, who fit on one slide. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of others that we as a profession, we as educators should respect, we should read, we should practice, we should interpret, we should implement. Educators have been de-skilled as a byproduct of the quest for innovation. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's been an education policy spiral that we've been engaged in around the world for the past two decades, in which the system continuously removes agency from teachers. So teachers become less thoughtful in their practice and then the results suffer. So then we repeat the process in which we remove more agency from teachers. They become more automatic in their process. The results suffer, et cetera. Teacher education and educational leadership programs, in my opinion, have become education appreciation. They're about education as opposed to really investigating learning. Now, startup culture is a religion with innovation as their belief. And what we find over and over again as we battle the invasion of the education space by billionaires who want to turn public treasure into private playthings is that facts, evidence, sound practice are no match for ideology. And there's an arrogance that suggests that history begins with me. And the idea of solutionism that says that if there's a problem real or imagined that hasn't been solved in two weeks by the people in that field, then, then some intern um, in Northern California will, should be able to come up with a solution. And that's just preposterous and it's mean spirited and it's degrading and disrespectful to the educators who are doing the job day in and day out. Educational innovation favors amateurs as I just mentioned a moment ago, that 
we rarely turn to expert educators when we're looking for ways to bring about forward momentum and progress and if you want change. Innovation's desire for scale creates more homogeneity. I mean that the refusal to abandon the most obviously terrible ideas like competition, scarcity, national curriculum, standardized testing, fail to enter any of the plans that the innovators project upon the educational system. And yet we know that those things are bad for children. There's an unwillingness to really tackle the critical underlying issues of race and class and wealth and economic inequality. And, and as a result, the sort of zero sum notion of an educational system in which there are naturally winners and losers gets perpetuated even by those who are advancing in the name of innovation. Now, it turns out that I'm not alone in this contrarian view. Last month, a book called The Innovation Delusion, How Our Obsession with the New Has Disrupted the Work That Matters Most was published. And I, and I highly recommend it. Now, this book refers to the impact of innovation culture on, on business and society, not specifically education, although I think there's a great overlap. Okay, I just wanna share a couple of the passages that, that jumped out at me. We think it's time to refocus on what's healthy for the vast majority of workers, for the businesses that aren't at the cutting edge of digital transformation, and for all of us who don't wanna be subject to the whims of a few out of touch billionaires. The ideology of change for its own sake is a recipe for disaster in the wrong hands. Economists have noted that the rate of innovation has decreased since about 1970. To put it another way, there is no evidence that actual innovation or technological change has increased during the period when everyone started talking about innovation. At its most extreme, innovation speak actively devalues the work of most humans, especially those who do the dirty work that keeps our technological civilization running. Innovation at its core is change that can be measured because it generates profits. Unlike actual innovation, which is tangible, measurable, and much less common, innovation speak is a sales pitch about a future that doesn't yet exist. Innovation speak is fundamentally dishonest. While it is often cast in terms of optimism, talking of opportunity and creativity and a boundless future, it is in fact the rhetoric of fear. Innovation speak is a dialect of perpetual worry. At a deeper level, innovation speak is built upon the hidden, often false premise that innovation is inherently good. So what do I know? Why should I be discussing this topic? Why should I be challenging you in this way? Well, I have some experience over the last 38, almost 39 years working in education, trying to help teachers identify ways to use the wondrous materials and technologies and ideas that already exist or that are emerging to create opportunities for kids, not just to know the things we've always wanted them to know with greater efficiency or efficacy or comprehension, but to be able to learn and do in ways that were unimaginable otherwise. So in 1982, I began one of the first computer programming camps for kids. I started teaching robotics to kids in the 80s and running online collaborative projects with kids as well around that time. Um, in 1990, I led PD in the world's first laptop schools, schools in which we gave every kid a laptop computer. In 1997, I was involved in designing one of the world's first online graduate school programs. I collaborated with Seymour Papert um, as the as the principal investigator on his last major institutional research project by creating an alternative high-tech multi-age project-based learning environment inside a prison for teenagers. I was a member of the One Laptop Per Child learning team. And in 2013, I co-authored Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom, a book that's been referred to as the Bible of the maker movement in schools. Now, what's important to note about all these times that I've been at the right place at the right time, these moments where I've been able to have an impact and move education forward. Um, the goal has never been to innovate. The goal has always been to sustain, to amplify, and to bring forward the grand traditions of progressive education, to make our dreams of learner-centered education meaningful and fully realized in our time, and hopefully, for generations to come. 
we saw a renaissance, an explosion, the possible of, of what was imaginable in classrooms when we put this intellectual laboratory and vehicle for self-expression in the hands and the backpack of each child. Now, again, all of this has been documented in doctoral theses, in books by schools, in books by historians, talking about the lessons and, and the exciting progress that was made when we put laptops in the hands of every child. And yet, we've spent the last 30 years arguing about whether this should be done or not. A funny thing happened with the pandemic. All of a sudden, it became a necessity to be able to do school via the internet. And therefore, immediately, all of these machines that were impossible to procure for children for the last 30 years dropped from the heavens and, and were delivered to children. The sad part about it is that there was no vi educational vision. There were no values associated with using the laptops. And in a lot of ways, they've just been used to reproduce the worst, poorest, least imaginative notions of schooling as opposed to amplifying human potential and creating opportunities to explore complexity and to collaborate and create in ways that were unimaginable even just a couple of years ago. So I'd like to propose some, an alternative vision and share some of my ideas for what I believe are the purpose of education. The first idea is that schools have an obligation to introduce children to things they don't yet know they love. That's why school exists, to bring kids together real in real time, in real space or virtually to introduce them to things they don't yet know they love. I used to say that the only reason I sent my kids to school was banned. It was the only thing that I didn't have at home. The second idea is that we, the schools are designed or should be designed to model, nurture and sustain democracy. This notion takes on extreme significance because as I'm speaking to you, 50% of the United States where I live, the country that I love, that I grew up in, that where I'm a romantic about our, our politics and our system of government, um, has voted for fascism and, and lies and deceit and science denialism and, and, and alternate facts. And so in this moment and in all moments, democracy should really be one of the purposes of education of inculcating democracy, of valuing and respecting and preserving and sustaining democracy. But that's only possible if we take seriously the notion of voice and agency of both students and teachers and power sharing, where, where everyone is able to have a stake in the system, where there's choice, where there's voting, where there's free will, where there's a lack and apt of coercion and an absence of mandates, where the needs of our local community are, where the needs of our community are recognized and respected and met by the stakeholders in that community. If you want kids to be good learners, they should spend time with people who are good learners. And one of the ways in which we do that is by finding a way for them to spend as much time as possible in the company of interesting adults. We need to democratize access to expertise, materials, and experiences. Again, that's the purpose of school, to provide opportunity to engage in experiences, to, to fall in love with things, to try out ideas, to, to develop skills and expertise and passion that wouldn't have occurred to us or wouldn't have been available to us without the institution's intervention. Now, a lot of times educators hear me speak or attend one of my workshops and, you know, they sit with their arms folded and they say, well, you know, that's all well and good for third grade or year two or seven year olds or nine year olds or 11 year olds. But I teach high school physics. What do you got for me? Well, what if you could apprentice with Galileo or Einstein? Turns out you can. This is my friend Stephen Wolfram. Stephen Wolfram is considered one of the most significant, most important mathematicians, scientists, computer scientists alive today, perhaps ever. Stephen Wolfram, since the pandemic began, and actually before that, has been running a series of Ask Me Anything question and answer sessions for kids about science, where kids can talk to him and ask questions about any topic that's on their mind, and he'll spend three, four hours at a time discussing those issues. In fact, Wolfram has recently announced that 
he believes he's on the cusp of revolutionizing physics. He's not an immodest gentleman, but he's got a pretty good track record. And he's making all of his data, his notes, the tools he uses for conducting his experiments, all available freely online. So anyone, including children, can engage with him in not only being taught physics, but being physicists. You know, the goal of education isn't to be taught math or be taught language or be taught physics or be taught music, but rather to be mathematicians and scientists and historians and architects and artists. And the, the technology that we have supercharges the breadth and depth and range of projects that are possible that will allow us to have those kinds of authentic experiences. When I was looking for images to share in this presentation, I found a, a YouTube video, which was an archive of a live coding experience that Wolfram engaged in with students from around the world, exploring um, the spread of coronavirus. Not only timely, right? That's kind of cool. But if you actually look at the date that this took place, it was February 10th, 2020. That was about a month before the president of the United States was saying, this was nothing, I never heard of it. It's gonna disappear you know, quickly. Imagine if hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of, of students around the world were engaged with scientists exploring coronavirus data in real time. Not only might that lead to a vaccine, but it certainly would have led to greater scientific literacy in the community and an unwillingness to accept you know, nonsense from, from political demagogues. The last big idea I think about the purpose of school is that school should be a place where you can become great at something. One of the biggest ideas that's at the bedrock of all of my work comes from Jean Piaget, who teaches us that knowledge is a consequence of experience. Knowledge is a consequence of experience, and there's no substitute for experience. To the extent we think that there might be some problem identifiable in education, it can almost always be diagnosed as an absence of experience or an impoverished experience being provided to students when a richer, more nutritious, more efficacious, real one is what is available. The best piece of advice I can give educators is less us, more them. Anytime you think you should intervene on behalf of some educational transaction, ask yourself, is there less that I can do and more that they can do? The more agency you shift to the learner, the greater they benefit from that experience. I believe one of the ways in which we get there is by focusing on projects and that the project should be a teacher's smallest unit of concern. Skills and themes, the stuff that we want kids to know, concepts emerge from projects. Projects aren't the dessert you get after you've suffered through a semester of asparagus. Projects should be the main course. And I'm obsessed with the question of what's the smallest seed I can plant that generates the largest blossom, the most beautiful garden? What's the least that I could do so students can do the most? There's a lot of discussion these days about kids being engaged in real world projects. And while I think that that's a good idea to the extent that it's possible, I, I think we should be careful not to disrespect childhood. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're seven years old, you shouldn't be curing coronavirus. That dinosaur you made out of cereal boxes is real world. And we should honor that. And we should delight in that. And we should use the beauty and innocence and curiosity and creativity and wonder of childhood to engage kids in rich intellectual exploration, creative construction of knowledge without refer requiring them to solve intractable problems that adults are struggling with. We need to eliminate competition, ranking, sorting, and contests. They do more harm than good. They have no value in educational practice. We need to remove coercion from the educational setting. I believe that coercion is the, re the enemy of learning. Imagine if we had a school system that was based on the notion that kids wake up at three o'clock in the morning with a burning desire to get back to school to continue working on something that matters to them. And our teachers wake up every morning and ask themselves, how do I make this the best seven hours of a kid's life? Imagine if we had an educational system that was based on the notion that everyone wants to be there and we all have something to gain from being, being with one another, engaged in, in purposeful activity. 
We need to recognize that young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. Young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. And it's incumbent upon us to build upon that capacity for intensity. Otherwise, it manifests itself as boredom or ennui or misbehavior. This is a photograph I took 28 years ago in one of the early laptop schools. And in the time that elapsed between hitting the return key and awaiting the result to appear on the screen, every ounce of the kid in the center of the pictures you know, persona, his, his aura was mobilized in anticipation of the result. And in that instance, and in hundreds of classrooms since, when I encounter a kid who has that level of intensity, a teacher comes up to me and tells me, yeah, that kid's not very good at school. And I've come to diagnose that as an acute intensity imbalance. There's an imbalance between the kid's sense of himself a recognition of the world in which he lives, the tools that he has available to, the, to, him, to him, his ability to learn with those materials and tools and the pace and the expectations of the classroom. And we need to do more to match and respect and leverage the remarkable capacity for intensity that children bring to it. So some strategies for going forward. One is we need to find the courage to edit a morbidly obese curriculum. My friend, Brian Harvey from UC Berkeley likes to say, the key to school reform is throw out half the curriculum, any half. We need to recognize that less is more. Seymour Papert taught me that at best school teaches one billionth of 1% of the knowledge that's in the universe, yet we quibble endlessly over which billionth of a percent is important. We should recognize in this increasingly technologically sophisticated age that if you make simple things easy to do, you make complexity possible. I would recommend that we be skeptical of ideas that become wildly popular overnight. I found throughout my years in education that bad ideas spread quickly. They're timeless and they tend to be impervious to geographic boundaries, while good ideas are fragile and require nurturing. Good ideas are frequently co-opted by the system and then denatured. And learner-centered ideas often become teacher-centered. So we need to be cautious about that. If we're concerned genuinely about innovation, we should let a thousand flowers bloom. Why should we create one model for the future? You know, education is one of the few sectors in which there's almost zero money invested in research and development. Boeing spends billions of dollars a year on planes that don't fly. Education needs to engage in more research and development. If something is successful, we'll scale it up. We'll find a way to, to do more of it and, to, and to, to shift resources towards it, to tell folks about it to shamelessly promote it. If it's unsuccessful, we go, oops, that, you know, that stunk up the room and we move on. But we should let a thousand flowers bloom. We should create multiple models of, of educational excellence across the globe. Now, I'm not a futurist, but I'll make one prediction for the future. And the pandemic has demonstrated that I've been right about this prediction for, for the decade or so that I've been making it. And that is that in the very near future, schools will no longer enjoy the monopoly on children's time they currently hold. But what do I mean by that? I mean that kids won't go to school for as long as they do today. Now, how do I know that I'm right about that? Well, we've seen during Zoom school, seven hour days have been dramatically reduced. We, we recognize that when we were an agrarian society, kids stayed home on the farm with their parents, when parents went off to jobs, kids went off to schools. Well, now people are working from home and that will be something that will happen in even greater numbers going forward. And maybe school won't be the only place where you're taught. It certainly isn't the only place that you'll learn. And one of the ways in which I know that I'm right about this is that every politician on earth for the last 20 years has said the exact opposite. That every proposal about improving education has been based on the notion of making the school day longer and making the school year longer as well. That's clearly on the wrong side of history. The question we need to be able to answer for ourselves as educators is, why did the kids even show up? How do we gain the greatest benefit from being co-located in the spa same space at the same time? How do we gain the greatest benefit from being together? What does being together in a, in a physical space or virtual space afford us? that we couldn't do on our own or we couldn't do in the community or in other settings. That's the, that's the only question that can answer the, about the viability of the future of education. And we need to address the question of how can schools create the conditions for students to become great at something 
And that something is a variable. The something isn't important to me as much as the kids can choose something as their project that they'll become great at and the schools will nurture that obsession. These are my grandchildren, Theodore and Irene. I'm scared about the uncertain future that faces them. Those of us who know better need to do better. If we don't stand between the kids and the madness, who will? And I'll leave you with this final thought that I saw on the wall of an exhibit in Reggio Emilia, Italy, that said, we are indeed partisans, partisans on the side of the child. Please won't you join me in being a partisan on the side of children. I look forward to discussing this presentation with you and taking your questions. Um, there are materials available at inventtolearn.com slash Barcelona. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and your attention and for the work you do on the side of children.